Hi there, my name is Dr. Tushar Mehta, I'm, and uh, I'm going to thank Animal Justice Academy for inviting me to do this video. Uh, all the fantastic people there, uh, the whole team, Kimberly Carroll, thank you, and uh, Camille, of course. All right, uh, every time I speak about this topic, the presentation gets longer, so please excuse me if I go a little bit over time. And I'm also going to try to move through the slides fast because there's a a lot of information to cover. Okay, it's called Animal Agriculture and the Global Environmental Impact. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, that's me. Okay, I'm a family and emergency doctor, mainly doing emergency medicine these days, which is a little bit difficult during the times of COVID. But uh, I also do some international work uh, in the past in India and more recently in Haiti. I'm very interested in global ecological issues, including um, those that affect animals um, everywhere. All right, my disclosures, no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest, okay? And you've got my uh, contact information there a little bit as well. I also uh, have co-founded um, Plant Based Data, uh, a website that is a free database resource for people to use around the world. And uh, hopefully you will check into that as well. We have lots of information there about uh, Plant Based Diet as it affects um, the environment, health, zoonotic disease, and more, including an economic section, which we're developing now. So getting started, let's take a look at our precious planet Earth over here, okay? And um, how beautiful it is from a distance and up close as well. But of course, there's a lot of problems, all right? We've heard maybe during COVID times that there's been an accelerated burning down of the Amazon. But this is a story that has been happening far before for um, you know, for many many years, for for decades, we've been uh, people have been burning the Amazon in order to especially um, cultivate uh, sort of meat you know, for the meat industry, and it's something that happens all around the world. In fact, okay, as people clear land to grow more animal-based foods, um, plant-based foods too, but mainly animal-based foods. Now, the goals in this presentation is to take a, a big picture, to have a big picture overview. Um, and look at the data regarding animals versus plant foods with respect to the environment and sort of understand that animal agriculture is actually one of the top three global ecological issues along with the entire fossil fuel and energy industry and uh, the global materials industry. Right? We're going to talk about some basic principles and this is, you know, you've got to have a concept here of science and numbers and the meaning of those numbers. Um, so we want to provide context to the things that we're saying here. Um, we want to know about agriculture in the context of other global parameters as well. And we're going to start with people. So everywhere you go, this is, uh, happens to be a hospital where I worked in India, you find beautiful and amazing, amazing people. All right. Um, here's some friends of mine in Haiti where, I've, um, where I'm currently doing some work. All right. So now the world population, okay, uh, we're going to talk about these, uh, the world population and some background factors before we get to the topic of animals themselves and animal use them itself, okay. Um, world population, the world is growing at about 1% per year. Does that sound like a lot? It means that if you start with 7 billion people, as we did a little while, a few years back, you get about 1 billion people added to the earth every 10 to 12 years, okay? Now, by 2050, uh, by 2050, uh, we're going to have about 10 billion people on the planet. And by the end of the century, we're looking at 12 to 15 billion people. There's a range of possibilities depending on human actions and how we manage what's going on in the world today. Okay, that's just a growth rate of 1%, give or take a little bit. Now, when it comes to poverty and inequality amongst that, you know, massive world population, okay, before COVID, uh, this just a year or two ago, there was estimated to be almost 800 million people living on less than $1.90 US per day, okay, globally. 113 million people who suffer food short shortages, meaning they, they can't get enough to eat. Right? and 74 million people affected by conflict and 40 million modern slaves. These are huge, huge numbers. Okay, When we talk about moderate poverty, um, these are people who may have enough to eat in terms of calories, but maybe not the quality of food that provides adequate nutrition. 
4.2 billion people. Now, after COVID, the number of people in extreme poverty has, ext has grown by 100 to 150 million people right there, okay? While the rich people on Earth, starting with billionaires, uh, they're growing ever faster. But the, the top 1% of people in the world are owning, are, are getting 82% um, of the new wealth that's created in the world. And it doesn't take much to be part of the global 1%, okay? So think about it this way. If you earn more than, let's say, $40,000, $50,000 Canadian per year as an individual, you're part of the global 1%. Okay, and uh, as an individual, if you uh, have assets of about a million dollars Canadian in 2019, you're part of the global 1% in terms of the wealth that you have. So it's very easy to be part of the global 1% and, and many of us watching this video probably are. Okay, um, let's keep going down. So population and inequity themselves are actually very sensitive topics that when you get more in depth about them, they... Um, uh, they're very sensitive and they're hard to discuss with respect and compassion or for people to be rational about. Okay, um, but there's a lot of social, social, economic, and science education that require that is required to to think and talk about these uh, issues um, in, in a meaningful way. And it highlights the idea or or the the fact, I believe, that when we talk about humans, animals, and the environment, that these are not separate issues. They're they're really different dimensions of one, you know, bigger issue about uh, about um, sustainability, about compassion, about uh, you know a better world. Okay, and we're not going to make substantial progress on one issue without making similar substantial progress on other issues. Now, we don't have time to get into this more deeply in this particular video, but it's a big topic. But just imagine if we don't provide education, sustainability, proper food for um, and economic opportunities and lifestyle for all those people how are they going to um, be interested in uh, preserving the environment more so than they're interested in about their day-to-day -day survival and whatever it takes to survive okay um, so that's just a glimmer into that but it's something that we should keep in mind for the rest of this presentation now moving back in time okay if we looked at the world 10,000 years ago, we looked at the animals on the world. Humans were only one species out of thousands and thousands of other vertebrate species. And if you took the combined mass of humans, it was you know, probably less than 1% compared to all the other wild animals that roamed the earth, you know, flew, on, flew in the air, whatever. We're just talking about land animals here. We're not counting fish, actually, okay? And... If you look at the world today, humans make up up to a third of the biomass and livestock that we breed and we control make up about two thirds of the land biomass of vertebrates. Wild animals have dropped down to, you know, maybe just 1%. Now this is, these are numbers by a scientist called Vaclav Smil, Canadian scientist. If you look at other numbers, then the total number of uh, uh, mammals on earth uh, they estimate to be um, one twenty-fifth, or about four percent, compared to humans plus our livestock. But it's in the same ballpark range. So, you know, if you just you look at chickens on Earth, one species bred by humans outweigh all uh, wild birds combined. That's fifteen to twenty thousand species of wild birds um, by a factor of three. Okay, so we have to appreciate the scale by which humans have impacted the Earth and all life on Earth. Between 1970 and 2014, according to the WWF and the Royal Zoological Society of the um, United Kingdom, um, humans have almost doubled in population and animals dropped in half between that time. But even in a short few years after that, by, 20, by 2017, there's another 8% drop in the population of wild animals that are tracked by uh, these scientific organizations. And it's a drastic and precipitous drop in wild animal populations, okay, due to human activities, okay. And if you, if you split that up between the different types of animals, um, again, this is the WWF uh, Royal Zoological Report, it's, you know, there's, there's uh, so much drop in uh, terrestrial versus marine versus freshwater animals 
and again, difference, differences between different continents and different species. Some species have been absolutely decimated and uh, are on the verge of extinction. The scale by which we change the Earth is vast. Humans have altered 75% of the land surface um, uh, on Earth. Okay? Two-thirds of the marine environment have been significantly altered. Three-fourths of all accessible freshwater systems are now devoted to crop or livestock use. And we have increased our crop production by 300% since 1970. So think about our impact on Earth. All right. And by the way, I'm going to say that we're going to provide my slides here too. So you can see all the references here and there'll be a reference list provided with this video as well, because you shouldn't just take what I say um, as, uh, as the truth. You should look it up and know that it's well referenced. Okay. Um, continuing on, the world's biomass, that means all um, mainly green, everything green that grows on Earth has been roughly cut in half by humans throughout um, our history over the, um, uh, the last centuries and maybe millennia but, millennia, but especially in modern times. And humans control about a quarter of everything green that grows on Earth um, through photosynthesis through the sun. And agriculture occupies 40 to 50 percent of the non-frozen sort of habitable um, surface area of the Earth timber harvest, uh, harvest the, the number of trees we cut down has increased so much as well. And what I tend to call this is ecological genocide. Okay, we're literally killing all life on Earth. We don't notice it in the most cases because we all live in our, our bubbles, right? We live in our little zones where we occupy as humans. But what's happening out there in the wilder, wider world and in the wilder world is, is this phenomenon. Now, moving on to animals, okay, we've given some background, we're going to talk about the role of animals here and why they have an impact on this terrible situation. And the first concept we got to know is feed conversion ratio. When you feed um, a living being, okay, a human or an animal, um, you're not converting all the food into body mass. When we feed chickens, in the most intensive factory farming conditions that are not organic and that we also use, um, uh, may, may use things to grow, uh, make them grow faster and we've bred them and so forth to, to grow abnormally fast, okay? It takes three to six kilograms of plant protein for uh, one kilogram of protein in the form of meat that somebody could eat, okay? So that's a loss of protein. And you can see the ratios there, the feed conversion ratios for other animals there, and the least efficient for ruminant animals like cattle or goats. Okay, They have to eat a lot more protein to create one kilogram of edible protein that, uh, that somebody may have. Okay, Milk and eggs sort of factor more efficiently, similar to um, chickens. Okay. And same with fish farms and insects and crickets too, okay? They're not that efficient. When you grow insects en masse, people say, oh, insects are going to save the earth by providing protein. Well, you're still going through a feed conversion ratio where you have to feed them plant protein to get back animal protein, okay? All right. And when we look at how much of food that actually is, that's a lot of soybeans or corn or grain to create that one kilogram of protein in the form of chicken flesh, okay? And when it comes to calories, the efficiency is even less. You're gonna have 10 calories to create one calorie in the form of chicken flesh, all right? Noting also that every farm is not as efficient to, you know, not so efficient to reach this maximum feed conversion ratio of let's say three to one. There are lots of problems that happen, and not everybody achieves this efficiency. Inefficiency is a waste. Okay, all that extra protein you had to feed the animal to get one protein, one unit of protein back, one kilogram protein back, that's waste. Okay, and re remember that when you're grazing animals, they're moving around, they're free range, they're running around, they're burning calories. They're also burning off some of their calories in the form of proteins. Organic farming, they have worse feed conversion ratios. So they take more land and more feed and are less efficient. Now, how do we make these animals so efficient in the first place? Like three to one is a phenomenally efficient ratio, okay? It's through genetic engineering, okay? You can see chickens as they were in 
1957 and what they have become in 2005 through breeding okay breeding animals is a form of genetic modification and they have uh, we have uh, bred chickens and other animals to grow abnormally large abnormally fast with consequences to those animals well-being in the meantime we also use direct gene modification like GMO okay but breeding has um, been more powerful than GMO so far okay and we're sort of re reaching a plateau with a lot of these animals in terms of how fast we can make them grow okay now terrestrial livestock land animals that human slaughter are 70 to 80 billion land animals slaughtered per year. That's more than 2,000 animals slaughtered every second of every day of the entire year. Okay, That's mostly chickens, but a lot of other animals too. Okay, So again, we're thinking of the scale of what, you know, we're nearly 8 billion people now on the planet. We've got to think of the scale of what we're consuming. Now, monogastrics, what do they eat? They're, monogastrics are chickens, pigs, and other birds. Okay, they eat um, grains, oil seeds, and things like that. Soy, all right? Ruminants can consume the same things, these grain, oil seeds, soy, but they can also graze on uh, grass and straw and uh, fodder and other kinds of food that the monogastrics can't eat. So they can graze, yes, but they also create more methane through the process of digesting, which is called rumination, uh, in, in their uh, digestive tract. Okay. So let's go back to planetary land use. As we mentioned, we've, we're using a tremendous amount of land on Earth and affecting it uh, terribly. We're, we're, we're you know, basically disrupting and destroying the environment in most of those places uh, to, to varying degrees. Okay. And 40 to 50 percent of the land use by humans is actually for agriculture and 30 to 40 percent is for animal agriculture okay the biggest portion there is for grazing and a good chunk of that is extensively grazed like heavily degraded land through the process of grazing now the crops that we grow on earth uh, occupy 10 to 15 percent of the uh, earth's surface but 50 percent of that actually goes to feed animals. Now, some percentage also goes to create um, materials, such as cotton that we use for clothing or other materials, okay? And uh, some of it goes to the use of biofuels. But the amount of land that we use to feed humans for direct human food, that is not gone through animals, okay? That is 10, sorry, five to 10% of the Earth's surface. And actually, um, by some calculations, it's closer to five you know, closer to 5%, like maybe, you know, 6% of the Earth's surface or something like that, that we use to grow food for direct human consumption. Now, despite using such a small percentage of the Earth's surface, uh, plant-based foods provide more than 60% of the protein that humans consume. And animal foods provide just under 40% of the protein that humans consume, okay? Grazing provides only 1.2% of the world's protein, despite taking the largest amount of land. So think about the efficiencies here and about how we're affecting land through the things that we eat as a human population. Okay. Now, the numbers vary slightly depending on the source, but they're within the same ballpark. Here's the United Nations data uh, in the middle column here shows and the orange part in the middle shows how much land we use for different industries and that um, that animal products um, are uh, the largest portion there. This is older data and uh, I'll give you some newer data as well. But um, uh, here's what's happening in the Amazon and many other places in the world. Okay, we're deforesting uh, the world in order to create grazing land or cropland to feed animals okay that then people eat okay and there are aside from the amazon there are other forests and rainforests throughout latin america africa and temperate areas throughout the world that are um, that see expansion of agricultural land um, that's used by you know that's meant for animals uh, um, for for livestock okay so fundamentally we have less efficiency if we are eating animals okay it takes 
uh, more plant calories and protein to make a smaller amount of animal food. It's more land, it takes more water, more pesticides, antibiotics, fertilizers, a bigger impact on the soil just because of the sheer volume. Okay, here's a great slide from Our World in Data. I encourage everybody to go to this website. It's a fantastic website and uh, it has a great summary of um, uh, uh, poor Nemechek's uh, data regarding land use. And I think, you, sorry, maybe this is more United Nations data. I'll come to the other one, data later. Okay, land use is ecosystem destruction. I think we've gone through that. We're losing, it's, it's you know, grazing and growing crops is the largest cause of deforestation on the planet. Okay, the number one cause of deforestation is animal agriculture. Rainforest loss, wetland loss, loss of natural grasslands, right? When we've changed natural grasslands, altered them to graze animals, they, they get changed, okay? Or create new grasslands where we deforest um, the world, and create new grasslands. And ultimately the loss of biodiversity, okay? The greatest impact on the environment and biodiversity, one of the greatest, okay, is is animal agriculture. Okay. As I mentioned before, it's as big or bigger than climate change and fossil fuel use and and um, um, the materials economy, okay? Because it's not just climate, it's land use and the other ways in which we impact the environment. So grazing versus factory farming. Now you see a lot of information these days, or a lot of advertising these days, I shouldn't say information, misinformation, saying that, you know, grazing is good for the environment. You have these cattle that uh, store carbon in the soil and everything like that. Note that factory farming uses far less land than grazing, okay? It's a lot less efficient than plant feeds, but it's a lot more efficient than grazing those same cattle. And there's bigger issues regarding antibiotic resistance, animal welfare, of course, but um, there's a net lower ecological impact. Grazing uses the most land, has a bigger biodiversity impact. Um, now, again, this is heterogeneous. There's different things that happen, but it also creates more methane release from ruminant animals as compared to factory farms. Okay. Animal agriculture is also the number one cause of soil erosion throughout the world. There's deforestation, wetland loss, the action of hooves, which these um, people are talking about uh, um, um, regenerative grazing, okay, that's uh, kind of a misinformation, to say that, oh, this hoof action is really good, but no, it also causes deep, um, soil erosion um, by many different mechanisms, okay, and ultimately it's a big part of desertification as well, whereas there's the land that becomes totally barren through um, human use of that land, uh, especially grazing, but also growing plant foods in unsustainable ways in many cases too. So there's many things that we can do to you know, completely destroy the land and soil. Um, Plow-based agriculture also is very disruptive to the soil, but remember that 50% of the crops you grow are fed to animals. Right? Now, grazing uh, uh, cattle, goats, sheep. Uh, okay, so we're summarizing here. Ch you know, changes natural vegetation, soil compaction, erosion, affects native birds, animals, reptiles, and mammals living in the area. And, um, and their animal waste, their dung, causes water contamination. And also wherever we're grazing animals and having these type of farms, uh, the humans who are farming these, uh, these animals will kill off any kind of animals that will interfere or predators. So you have extinction of predators um, wherever people are, are grazing animals. And you see that worldwide. So don't be fooled by industry misinformation like uh, this person, Alan Savory, and his uh, very popular TED Talk, which sort of says, oh, you graze animals and store carbon in the ground and solve environmental problems. And it's a very beautiful story that he tells, but it's just full of misinformation. And now you have people like Woody Harrelson and making movies like Kiss the Ground uh, and, um, and, and giving completely um, bogus information. But you know, funded by this massive industry and uh, having the means of producing such, you know, such um, sophisticated misinformation. Sacred Cow is another one of those, okay, if anybody's seen the movie. Um, at Plant Based Data, we've just published this article um, debunking or basically uh, sort of analyzing this uh, recent study that came out regarding uh, how. Um, grazing and sort of this uh, multi-species tra traditional type farming done right can store carbon in the ground and and reduce climate change impact and everything like that so please check out that article and we'll have more 
Water use. Okay, we've mentioned this already. It takes more water to grow a unit of plant protein or a calorie unit as compared to plants, simply because we are having much more to feed them to get one unit of food back. Okay, all right, so let's just keep going here. And then the animal waste often causes pollution into water. So uh, the waste from animal farms or even from grazing uh, oftentimes runs off into water systems, causes eutrophication and lots of toxic effects for the life in freshwater systems and ultimately into the ocean as well. Um, there is bacteria and parasites that affect human health and all animal and plant life. There's soil erosion and uh, massive reservoirs of poop that come from these big factory farms. Again, thinking about the number of animals that we eat and the waste that they create. Consequences are dead rivers and lakes, water contamination, dead zones in the ocean and coastal areas. Okay. Now coming to climate change, there is a debate as to how much CO2 equivalents are caused by animal agriculture. In 2006, there was a report saying it's 18%. Then another report in the UN sort of got their hands smacked by industry and government saying they don't like those numbers. They don't look good. The industry didn't want to be criticized. So, um, you know, there was some pressure and you get this revised number of 14.5%. Others uh, in the World Watch uh, magazine published a number of uh, 51%. Now, the truth is likely somewhere in between these extremes of the numbers. And it depends on what things and what factors are actually included in the cal calculations. Sometimes if they're excluding things which actually do have an impact, um, then they're lowballing the number. Okay, so, uh, but it's just good to be aware of this range and not take any one of these numbers as gospel, but realizing that it's probably somewhere in between. The climate change gases created from animal agriculture are carbon dioxide when you have decomposing biomass, when people are draining wetlands and converting them to pasture or cropland for feeding animals, uh, deforesting, you're burning the forests like we are doing in the Amazon and other places, you're creating a lot of CO2. That's land use change. Okay. Then there's methane, which comes from decomposing animal waste, decomposing uh, waste from the biomass of land use change, and also the rumination of animals. So um, cattle, goats, sheep, they ruminate and they create methane. Nitrous oxide comes from similar sources of animal waste and decomposing biomass. Okay, And that, that together they create the climate change gases that are emitted by animals. So if you look here, there's a simple graph showing beef compared in extensive means grazing beef, you know, it have, having the biggest column there of um, uh, CO2 emissions than sort of uh, other beef systems, but factory farm beef intensive systems have create less uh, climate change gases, and then monogastrics much less, and soy beans and pulses a minuscule amount. Okay. In a better graph, I'm just going to flash through this so that you can see how um, the plant foods at the bottom create much less climate change gases than the ones in the slide below. And this is slightly newer data, okay, showing a, a better picture of, of what's really going on with these with these animals. And note that farmed fish are included this in here too, okay? They create a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, again, through their feed and other process, okay? And when you look at the variations, if you, if you grow different, you know, different farmers or different, different places on the earth are different, so there's variations there. This slide shows the range of um, greenhouse gas emissions from different types of animal-based foods as well as plant-based foods. And some plant-based foods touch on zero or touch on negative emissions simply because they truly do store more carbon in the ground uh, than they release through the farming of those things. Now, uh, that may be time limited for a few years or decades, but um, it's very interesting. So I'm not going to get too much into that, but it's good to be aware. Again, these slides are from Our World in Data. This is a great slide from Our World in Data showing the different components of climate change gases that come from animal agriculture. Moving on, let's talk about fish. All right, so uh, fish consumption has increased exponentially throughout the years. We've gone from uh, 20 million tons fish harvest in 1950 to like 140 million tons in 2016 that's harvested from the ocean and 60 million tons from aquaculture okay fish farms all right and there's a huge component of what we call 
U U fishing. That means illegal, unregulated, undocumented. There's a lot of fishing that happens in the ocean that is not tracked, that makes its way into fish markets around the world and including into North America. Because when you buy fish in North America, you don't most of the time know where it's coming from. Or they may say where it's coming from, but it may not actually be the real source as well. Okay. Now people consume somewhere between one to two or even more trillion fish per year. Okay. That's roughly, I'm going to say 25,000 to 70,000 fish per second. Again, imagine the scale at which we are uh, just depleting the oceans. Okay. The biggest cause of ecosystem destruction in the ocean is fishing more than everything else. Okay. There's plastic pollution, there's all kinds of stuff, but the biggest problem is actually fishing. That is just you know, devastating the, the marine environments. 33% of fish populations are harvested at vastly unsustainable levels, which is completely decimating those populations. And 60% of fish populations are maximally fished, okay? They're right at the edge of being like sort of just completely collapsing, but they've already been diminished by quite a lot. And only 7%, according to the United Nations data, that are sort of at replacement levels. You, you, you're, people are fishing there, but at replacement levels. Fish is not an eco-friendly food, and farmed fish is not an eco-friendly food. Okay, farmed fish are mostly fed wild fish. They, the file, they, they, people catch the fish that are not as attractive to eat for humans, devastating sort of different levels of the food chain or food web. Okay, uh, different trophic systems. If you want to be more te technical, and then grind them up and feed them to the farmed fish. And fish farming has uh, a huge number of um, uh, environmental problems, which we're not going to go into detail here, but just uh, we can continue learning about. Now, when they say that, oh, there's these eco fish and there's dif different fish certifications, it's mostly bogus, okay? The fishing industry basically dominates and runs the, f the eco certification organization. So the certifications are kind of like a marketing um, for uh, you know, for the for the fishing industry itself, okay, they don't pro provide any reliable information. It's just it's just stuff they say to make eco fish sound like a good thing, okay. And there's lots of studies on fish sentience, cognition, memory, social interactions, and pain, etc. That people sometimes, you know, give less credit to fish compared to other animals, but it's it's not necessarily, uh, well, it's not absolutely uh, a a rational thing to do, okay. Um, but it's kind of like our human bias that we, that we have there. Fish are being extinct. Okay, there's many fish populations that have been, um, that are on the verge of complete extinction, that will completely lose those species, or functionally extinct, means we've just wiped out most of the population of that fish, there's very few left, and they don't function in the environment, or they're not present in the environment that they used to be. Okay, um, Sharks, population have been completely devastated. Again, this is mainly fishing. Whales are less than 1% of the original populations. And note that whale hunting still goes on, but even still, the biggest um, uh, impact on whales is they're getting caught in fishing nets, okay? But then there's also the plastic pollution and whale hunting and other things that goes on. Mammals, birds, and everything in the ocean gets caught in fishing nets. And there's no such thing as dolphin-safe tuna. That's just something they write on the can, completely made up, you know, dolphin safe tuna net. It just actually doesn't exist. And there's all kinds of bycatch. So there's all kinds of unreported, undocumented fishing that we mentioned, that fishing you know, uh, things that are fishing, sort of fishing fish populations that are supposed to be protected. Okay. And shark finning, whale killing. There's a military competition over the seas as different countries now sort of vie for the diminishing returns that we're getting from the oceans. You know, there's um, different countries that have become very militant about controlling different parts of the oceans. When it comes to the plastic in the oceans, uh, ALDFG, that's a term, okay, abandoned, lost, discarded fishing gear is one of the biggest, but definitely the most devastating, one of the most devastating forms of plastic pollution ocean. Uh, plastic pollution in the ocean. Okay, it makes up about 20% or more of the actual plastic in the ocean. It's not just plastic bags floating there. It's fishing fishing gear. When these massive fishing industries, when their nets are no good anymore, they just cut them off and leave them in the ocean. That's the easiest and cheapest and um, uh, thing to do. 
46% of the garbage in the Great Pacific Gyre, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, is basically fishing gear, okay? Ghost nets. And these nets continue to entangle all kinds of life for years and years and years and years. And so, you know, the media has us banning straws and say, let's get rid of straws from like, you know, whatever, Starbucks or something like that. Those are fake solutions that are created by industry to make everybody think that we're doing something when we're not doing anything actually at all. Okay. Let's go to hunting. So hunting, extinction, wild animal biomass. And the, now it's interesting when we look back in human history, okay, in prehistory, that during the quaternary extinction period, that's 50,000 to 3,000 years ago, during that time span, humans were involved in the extinction of about half of all large animal uh, species, um, these large animal populations. Humans spread over the globe during that time, and everywhere they went, they, they did become hunters, and they completely wiped out an extinct half of the population of what we call megafauna. Climate change was also involved, but it was sort of concurrent cause. You know, it's, it's thought that climate change, a lot of these animals can adapt to this very slow climate change, but humans would just, you know, completely finish off these populations, right? But this occurred slowly over thousands of years, but currently the biomass of wild mammals, the megafauna, we talked about it, it's, it's about six times lower than pre-human times, and we also discussed how immense the human population and, and livestock population is now, okay? So think about where we are now proportionately and how fast also right now we are hunting uh, animals, okay? Um, of the 362 megafauna species, okay, that means large animals, okay? 70% are in severe decline and 59% are at risk of extinction. Hunting is the biggest cause. It's concurrent with other causes. When people are logging into forests and whatnot, they, they create a lot of roads and then we have cell phones, guns, fossil fuels, and everything like that that enables the hunting to, to follow down the trails of new human settlements and expansion into forests, etc. Habitat loss is also a major concern as we continually for example, burn down the Amazon to create more beef, um, you're losing habitat. Um, and as we're farming more and expanding everywhere, we're losing habitat, okay? So there's other factors too, but there's a combined um, sort of insult. But hunting is a very, very big impact on large animal species. You know, people tend to hunt large animals. They're the biggest targets that, uh, for everybody. They also reproduce more slowly. And um, they're the biggest sort of bang for your buck for people who do want to hunt, right? Now, when we talk about food security and we want to talk about feeding this massive human population, right? We're going to be 10 billion people and we need to feed 10 billion people. The idea is not that we don't want people to starve or be hungry. We want to create sustainability. So how do we feed everybody um, as we learn also how to create uh, sustainability amongst human population growth? Food security, okay? So... Animal agriculture uses 30% of the non-frozen surface of the earth, maybe a bit more. If we converted all of our land that we use for animal agriculture just to feed humans instead by plant-based foods directly eaten by humans, you could feed another 4 billion people without using any additional land. So that means that plant-based foods can you know, help immensely in feeding a world of 10 billion people by 2050. Now, it doesn't mean that we're good at sharing food, sharing resources, getting, you know, food and economics and, and, and sort of economic opportunities to people who need it, but um, we have that potential through plant-based foods, okay? So there's more issues than just converting to plant-based foods. Um, 70 to 90 percent of the world's soy, okay, is actually fed to animals, 30 to 40 percent of the world's grains, and 50 percent of the world's total crop production is fed to animals, okay? Again, directly feeding those crops back to people, you know, you could, you know, or, you know, using that land to grow food for people and feed more people. When we export uh, crops and meat from poor countries to the richer countries, we are taking away land, food, and water that was used to grow um, those animals, to raise those animals. We're taking that away from the global poor and diverting it to the global rich many times taking it from poor countries to rich countries or sometimes even within the country we're creating this greater inequity okay and the more of the environment that is destroyed it affects poor people more 
We are land grabbing. Okay, we're taking land away from people who live there. The Amazon, again, is a prime example where we're displacing indigenous people. But this happens everywhere in the world where people who started growing um, cattle ranching and doing that kind of stuff took land away from people that were there before, Aboriginal people in most cases, okay, and, and used that land, occupied that land for, for ranching and growing animal-based foods. Biofuels pose a lot of the same problem, though not as big, but biofuels are also a serious problem. So now let's get to plant-based foods, okay? I've given all the background information here, and what it means basically is that you can grow more food if you're plant-based, okay? More food, more protein on a very much smaller footprint of land, okay? The land that you save by growing on a, and using a lower amount can be rewilded. You can allow nature to come back to those land areas, okay? So you can... Um, you can you can basically improve the environment um, by a lot okay and then if we use conservation agriculture methods because right now a lot of our plant-based foods are not grown sustainably but we have great opportunities and ways of making them more sustainable so then when we're growing plant-based foods we should use conservation agriculture methods because a lot of the plant-based foods that we grow are not grown sustainably um, there's a lot of pesticides and monocultures that are not always a good thing, okay? We can use better methods. We can use methods that don't till the soil, no-till or low-tillage agriculture, and preserve the soil as we're growing our plant-based foods. So these are things we should do. So growing our plant-based foods through conservation agriculture and using food justice practices. That means sharing the food and economic opportunities that come with growing food uh, better around the world, okay? okay. So that's what we should be doing. And also wasting less. I should mention that there as well. In the process of uh, being more plant-based, we should really think about our pulses, okay? That means, you know, beans and lentils and soy, okay? They have a huge amount of protein. They create very, very few climate change gases, okay? They um, uh, can even store car carbon in the ground, actually, um, to, uh, to some extent okay and fix nitrogen help other crops grow therefore use less nitrogen based uh, fertilizers and um, indigenous people used a lot of pulses in the americas okay there was the wisdom of the three sisters people grew beans corn and squash which grew together very well fertilized each other supported each other and provided a very very complete protein and complete nutrition outside of just protein as well okay um, Soy is fantastic for people's health, and we can grow lots of organic and um, conservation agriculture uh, um, use for soy. It's fantastic for people's health, okay, contrary to what you find on the internet. And uh, whole grains are also 10% protein by, math, ma by mass, and we should be eating whole grains because they're also fantastic for our, but for our health, okay? We're not talking about refined foods here. Canada's food guide now talks about this, okay? There are recent food guide, I don't know if it's going to change in the future, um, has emphasized more plant proteins, but even more so than the uh, Canada food guide, the Eat Lancet, okay? This is the Lancet Commission on, on Health and the Environment and Food Security, okay? Talks about eating more plant-based foods for sustainability and food security and human health, okay? That we can feed much more ecologically and economically 10 billion people by 2050 and also improve human health, especially things like cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and so, on, so forth. I have a good video on that you can check out as well. All right. um, so plant-based diet is, a fundament, is fundamental to reversing the global ecological crisis. Remember, it's a complex issue. Okay, There's food waste, there's biofuels, there's human inequities. But think of pulses and whole grains as our main protein components going forward okay there's things like plant-based meats and and cultured meat that's going to be coming out pretty soon i hope but remember that is kind of a treat and we want to focus more on the the healthiest the most sustainable of the plant-based foods all right eat the rainbow okay of our whole food plant-based diet and uh 
get uh, you know get all the the best plant-based foods for you okay remember that some plant-based foods have a high Im eco ecological impact okay certain oils or eating too much oil eating too much sugar palm oil especially uh, like our ramen noodles or many things are full of palm oil avocados food that we transport on airplanes think of the packaging and sugar uh, that isn't many much of that you know so those are all different types of things we don't need okay think also about human rights okay there's a great organization food is power okay talking about uh, sustainably grown and more uh, and chocolate that does not abuse uh, human rights and bananas and workers rights issues around the world think of those things too okay as we talk about ethical um, plant-based foods all right and uh, remember that all of these pandemics that i've listed here are connected to animal agriculture okay that animal agriculture basically breeds viruses and other pathogens when we have these you know hundreds of thousands millions of animals billions of animals okay and i have a lecture on that as well which you can uh, look up and ch check it out okay and uh just wrap up by showing that you know compassion and ecology towards humans towards animals and the environment are all interconnected okay and these these fantastic people also thought so okay and um in conclusion, uh, plant-based diet is fundamental sustainability on par with the materials economy and fossil fuel use. Okay, remember also we should not get too egotistical. And you know, some people say, "Oh, I'm plant-based, so therefore I can fly more, or just own a, you know, it'll offset my large house or something." That's not true. Okay, we also have to think of our material footprint very profoundly, and we don't want to look at this issue in isolation of social justice, women's rights, population, LGBTQ. Uh, economics, governments, you know, the, the, our industries of peace and war and other forms of just massive material and energy overconsumption, okay, that we, that we engage in. These are concurrent issues that we must address if we truly do want to solve environmental problems, okay. It's not just about plant-based diet, but that is a necessary uh, thing amongst everything else. All right, my website, shout out to Greta, okay, guys. And uh, again, shout out to the um, animal justice team i hope you guys have enjoyed this uh lecture and um and uh, we'll see you soon okay take care thank you